Welcome back. In this episode, we're gonna add a game over screen when the player is dead. What? I say he did. So, let's go. First of all, we need to implement a scenario when the game will be over. So, to do this, let's open the player respawn script. And since we implemented the checkpoint system in the last video, I think it would be reasonable to call game over when no checkpoint is available. So, this is what we're gonna do at the beginning of the respawn method. Also, we need to rename the function to check respawn because we have a similarly called function inside the health script and this can create issues. Now let's get back into Unity, select the player object and open the animation tab. When you're done, open the die animation and select the animation event on the final frame. Now let's change the function here from respawn to check respawn. Alright, once you have that, let's open the player respawn script again and implement the actual code. We're gonna use an if statement that checks if the current checkpoint equals to no. If that's the case, that means the player has no available checkpoint, so we're gonna show the game over screen and return. And just to remind you, return means that the rest of this function will not be executed. So all of this code will just be ignored in this case. Great, now let's actually work on activating the game over screen. For this, let's return into Unity and select the UI canvas object. We'll make this object responsible for managing the UI. So to achieve this, we need to go into the scripts folder, create a new folder called UI, and inside let's create a new script called UI manager. When you have it, attach it to the UI canvas object and open it. As usual, we'll start by cleaning it up. Then we'll add a reference to the game over screen because we need to be able to activate and deactivate the game object from inside the script. The next variable that we'll need is a private audio clip called game over sound and we'll play this one when the game over screen appears. And finally we'll create a public void called game over which will activate the game over screen and play the game over sound as we mentioned earlier. Now we can actually use this method and call it from the player respawn script. So let's get back to that. To call the method we need to gain access to the UI manager script. So I'm gonna start off by creating a private UI manager variable. Now we need to grab the reference and to do this I'm gonna use find object of type and pass in the UI manager class. If you're not sure what this method does, let's check the documentation together. As you can see, it says here that this method will return the first active loaded object of a certain type. So in our case, Unity is going to look for the entire hierarchy and return the first UI manager that it finds. This function can be very useful, but it has downsides. First of all, don't use it when there is a risk of running into duplicates. Secondly, it can be very taxing on your performance if you're calling it repeatedly in rapid succession, like for example inside the update method. But in our case, we're only calling it once inside the wake method and we're looking for a single object that has no duplicates, so it's safe here. Alright, now that we have the variable, we can go inside the check respawn method and just say UI manager dot game over. And make sure to use the name of the variable here, not the class itself. Alright, now let's get back into Unity and create the game over screen as a child object of the UI canvas. Once you have that, you can select the UI canvas and drag the game over screen object inside the game over screen field. Alright, now we need a game over sound and a font that we're gonna use on the game over screen. I'm gonna put a link to both in the description. Please don't judge the sound too harshly, I made it myself. Feel free to use a different sound, but once you have it, make sure to drag it inside the game over sound in the UI manager script. I also imported a font and I don't want it to be inside the audio folder because that's going to trigger my OCD. So I'm going to create a new folder called fonts and drag it in there. Okay, once that's done, let's go back to the game over screen object. First of all, we want to make it stretch on the entire screen. So let's select the anchor presets, press alt and select the bottom right one. Next up, inside the game over screen, let's create a new UI object of type image. And let's make this one stretch on the entire screen as well. I'm gonna rename it to background now, give it a red color and use an alpha opacity of 0.2 to make the image transparent. 
You can play around with the image color and transparency, but I think we're gonna change it later anyway, so you might as well wait on that. The next step is to create a text object underneath the game over screen. In the text field I'm gonna write you died in all caps just to invoke some good memories for people who play Dark Souls, Bloodborne or Elden Ring. Then change the font from Arial to the one that we imported recently. Now let's drag it out to increase its size and make it look bigger. Enable best fit and increase the max size to 300. I'm happy with this position so next I'm gonna change the color of the text to a light red. And to make it more visible I'm also gonna add a shadow component to this text. If you never used this before you can adjust the X and Y position of a shadow and also its color. I want the shadow to be slightly below the text so I'm gonna use an X position of 0 and a Y position of minus 10. This is how it looks in the game right now. I'm not really happy with it so I'm gonna increase the alpha to 1 to make it completely black with no transparency and add an outline component to the text. You can adjust how thick the outline is by changing the effect distance X and Y. I think I'm gonna go with 5 on the X and 5 on the Y to make it more pronounced and change the alpha of the color to 1 here as well. When you're done tweaking just rename the text object to something that makes more sense to you, like I did. Alright, next up I'm gonna change the color of the background again and make it a bit darker just so we have more contrast and the text is more visible. I'm also gonna increase the alpha to make it a bit less transparent. Alright, once you're happy with the position of the text and the color of the background, let's duplicate the you died text and rename it to restart. Also change its color to white. Next up I'm gonna make it a bit smaller, drag it up, change the thickness of the outline to 3 and the Y position of the shadow to minus 7. And after looking at it again I decided to raise it up to minus 5, but that's just me tweaking, it's not very important. Alright, now we have the first option that's gonna restart the level in case we die. Now we need the second one that's gonna take us to the main menu. So select the restart object, duplicate it and drag it down. You can see that I tried a couple options of how to call this one, but I think in the end main menu is the best because it's short and it's clear. And finally the last option is quit for all the rage quitters out there. So let's repeat the same process, duplicate the main menu object, drag it down and rename it to quit. When you're done positioning everything, let's rename all the objects so that they make sense. Now this next part is important. So let's make sure to select all three objects, so restart, main menu and quit, and go down to add component and add a button to all three of them. Immediately after that press the plus sign which is gonna add a method to all three buttons. Now to clean it up let's select the game over screen and create a new child object underneath it called options. Make it stretch over the entire screen and when you're done select restart, main menu and quit and drag them inside options. Now inside the game over screen let's create a new image and call it selection arrow. You probably figured out that this will be the arrow that moves up and down and allows us to select a certain option from this menu. On the X I'm gonna position it at minus 400 and select the fireball sprite for the source image. Now let's check the preserve aspect checkbox to make sure that the fireball looks normal and adjust the width and height to 120 pixels. After a bit of tweaking I decided to change the X position to minus 350. Now I'm gonna add a shadow component to the fireball and position it at 0 and minus 10. And also an outline with an X and Y of 2. Ok, we're done with the graphical part. Now as I said this fireball will go up and down and when the player presses the interact button a certain behavior will be executed depending on which current option we have selected. Alright, now let's go into the scripts UI folder and create a new script called selection arrow. Attach it to the selection arrow object and let's start coding. The first variable that we'll need in here is a private rect transform called rect. 
and to get access to it inside the awake method we're simply going to use the get component function. And for everyone who's not sure what a rack transform is, let's take a couple seconds off to explain it. You already know that every object in Unity has a standard transform, which determines the position, the rotation and the scale of the object. Well, a rack transform is basically the same, except it's for UI objects and it adds a couple new options. First of all, we can change the width and height of a rack transform, which is measured in pixels by the way. And secondly, it has an anchor and a pivot, which allows us to attach the rack transform to a certain part of the screen. The rack transform will stay there, even if the screen size changes. Alright, that was a basic introduction. Now let's get back to what we needed to do, and that is basically changing the Y position of the selection arrow to fit the Y position of the current option. So let's jump back into the code and see how we can do this. As I said, we will need the Y position of all the options. So let's create a private direct transform array and call it options. Also, we'll need to serialize it to be able to assign all the references inside the editor. Alright, back into Unity. And once it's compiled the code, you should be able to see the options array. Now we can drag all the options in one by one, or you can lock the selection arrow and drag them all inside at the same time. The important thing is to get the order right, so first restart, then main menu, then quit. The next variable that we will add to the script is a private integer called current position, and it will indicate which option is currently selected. Next we'll need a private void called change position, which will take in an integer argument. The first thing that we're going to do inside this method is add the change to the current position. And immediately after that we're going to change the selection arrows rec transform position. So let's create a new vector free. And on the x we're just going to maintain the rec transform's current value. On the y we're going to grab the option that is currently selected and use its y position. And on the z axis we're just going to use 0. I'm also going to put a comment here just to make sure that you don't forget what this line does. Good, but right now we have a problem, and that's the fact that the current position can become negative and it can become bigger than the length of the options array. So to prevent that, let's first check if the current position is smaller than 0. If that's the case, we're gonna assign a value of options.length-1 to the current position. And I use minus 1 here because counting in array starts from 0. And secondly, we need to check if the current position is bigger than the options.length-1. If that's the case, we're gonna make the current position equal to 0. Alright, now we should be able to change positions. Next up, let's add a private audio clip called change sound, and we're gonna play the sound when we change the position of the selection arrow. And because we need to assign it in Unity, let's serialize this variable. Now you can just press Ctrl D to duplicate this line to create another audio clip called interact sound. The change sound is going to be played when we move the arrow up and down, and the interact sound is going to be played when we have an option selected and we decide to press enter. Now let's use these variables. First let's go into the change position method, and right after the first line we're going to check if the change is different than zero. So basically we're checking if the current position has really changed. If that's the case we're going to use the sound manager and tell it to play the change sound. But we still haven't used the change position method anywhere, so even if this code works, we can't see it for now. This is why we need an update method. And here we're first gonna check if the W key is pressed or the up arrow key is pressed. So when the player presses any of these keys, we need to move the arrow up. And we will do that by calling change position and passing in minus 1. Some of you might ask why in this case minus 1 and not 1, because usually when we press up we expect the number to go up, but in this case it's quite the opposite. Let's take a look at this array for example and say that the arrow is in the middle with position 1. If we want the arrow to go up to the first element, then we need to decrease the current position. Alright, now let's check the opposite scenario where the player presses the S key or the down arrow. And obviously in this case we want to use change position again, but pass in 1, not minus 1. You might have also noticed that I deleted the else keyword, but in this case it doesn't matter, it's gonna work regardless. Alright, now let's get back into Unity. First of all let's deactivate the game over screen object, then find the selection arrow object and assign the change sound and the interact sound. For the change sound I'm actually gonna use the same sound effect that we used for the arrows. I think it works pretty well in this scenario. 
And for the interact sound, I'm going to use the live sound effect that we used for the health pickups. Okay, finally done. Let's see how it works. Okay, so what we did so far is working nicely. Now let's continue. Let's open the UI manager script now and create an awake method where we deactivate the game over screen, just in case we forget to deactivate it manually. Now let's jump back into the selection arrow script and start implementing interacting with options. First I'm gonna leave a comment here just so you don't forget that this part of the code is responsible for changing the position of the arrow and this one of interacting with options. So now we need to create a private void called interact and we're gonna use it inside the update method in case enter or E is pressed. Now inside the interact method the first thing that we want to do is use the sound manager to play the interact sound. And I finally got around to changing the down arrow to the E key. But don't forget that you can change these keys in case you prefer something else. Alright, now the most important part. To interact with each option we need to access the button component on it and call its onClick method. So we're gonna grab the current option first, then use git component to get access to the button component. And you can see here that autocomplete doesn't understand what button is, and that's because we didn't include the unityengine.ui library, so don't forget to do that, it's important. Once you have that you'll see that the button keyword works now, and we can access the onClick function and use invoke to call it. Alright, what we need to do now is assign a method to each button, otherwise it's not going to do anything. The methods will be stored inside the UI manager. So let's select all three objects and drag the UI canvas inside the onClick field. Alright, now let's open the UI manager script and create all the methods. All of these methods need to be public in order to be assigned to the buttons. The first one will be the restart function. In order to make this work we need to use the scene manager. So let's add the unity engine.scene management library first. Now inside the restart method we can just say scene manager.loadScene. Next we need to pass in an integer argument. But we can't just simply pass in a number like 0 or 1 because that could take us to the wrong level. Rather we need to get the index of our current level. And to do this we're going to use the scene manager again and call the get active scene function. Then just type in dot build index which is going to return the number of the current level. If you're still not sure what this means let's go back into unity and press file build settings. And here you can see that each level has an index. So level 1 has the index 0 and level 2 has the index 1. So for example if we're trying to restart level 2 get active scene is going to return index 1 and the scene manager will reload level 2, basically resulting in a restart. Alright, that's the first function. Now let's move on to the second one which is going back to the main menu. To make it easier on yourself you can just copy paste the restart function because it's gonna have a lot of similarities. Now let's rename the void main menu and remove the get active scene function from inside the parentheses. And instead of it just pass in 0. And the thinking here being is that the main menu is usually the first scene that needs to be loaded before going to the levels. Obviously this is not a hard rule, you'll find some exceptions, but in our case this will definitely be true. Alright, that's it for this function. Now let's copy paste it again and create the last one which will be quit. Remove the scene manager code and instead just type in application.quit. Ok, we're finally done. Now let's get back into Unity and assign all the functions. First let's select the restart object. Now press on the no function field. Then select UI manager and finally select restart. Ok, that's the first one done. Now let's repeat the same process for the main menu object. Only this time we select the main menu function, not restart. And finally the quit object with the quit function. 
Ok, we're done with all the buttons. Now let's go into the levels folder and create a new scene for the main menu. We're gonna call it underscore main menu so that it appears first before all the levels. Then open the build settings and drag it to the top so that the main menu is the first scene in the game. You can open the scene but we're gonna leave it empty for now. But what you can do is create an image and give it some random color, just so it doesn't look like a blue screen of death. Ok, now let's get back to our level and test everything that we've done so far. Let's try restart first and you'll see that it works, it takes us to the beginning of the level. Now let's try main menu and see what it does. And as you can see it takes us to the empty level. There's nothing to do here for now but we're gonna add that in the next episode. And finally the quit button is not gonna work inside Unity but it will work when we build the game. If you still want a button that exits play mode, here's how you do it. Let's go into the UI manager and in the quit method underneath the application.quit Let's add Unity Editor. Dot editor application is playing equals to false. So now we have a way of exiting play mode directly from inside the game. Awesome, that's it for today. Thanks a lot for watching and thanks a lot for your patience. If you want to help me make more videos, consider supporting the channel on Patreon. And don't forget to smash like and subscribe. Stay safe and keep making games.